Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this morning I'm here to update you on some of the developments in Miku North. So I'm happy to announce that a week and a half ago, we officially commenced work on the new Naripo Cemetery. Yeah. Uh, this project is expected to span over a period of a year and a half uh, until we get to completion. Um, also, we recently installed lights on the Passius Plain Field. I think I made a pronouncement some time ago about uh, putting lights on the Passius Plain Field. I'm happy to announce that we have officially completed the installation of the lights and we're going to have an official light turning on ceremony on the 21st of February. Um, also, the Passius Preschool. I'm happy that we were able to. Um, this preschool has been an eyesore in the community. Okay, it was incomplete, has been incomplete for two and a half years, and I'm happy that the Prime Minister has finally um, found the funding so that we can complete this school. So we are going to be starting the work uh, towards the completion of this preschool this month. And more importantly, the Miku Jetty. Um, this has been something that has made the airwaves over and over, so I'm happy to say that as we speak today, the Miku Jetty, the materials for the Miku Jetty has landed in St. Lucia. The final consignment of materials are going to land, it's going to land on the 14th of February, um, and we're looking to commence work immediately after the materials have landed. And also, the Passius Water Project um, recently went to Parliament to allow WASCO to go ahead with the expansion of the water project in Passius and this water project supplies communities from Prale down to Magritude. So Passius, Monripo, Loba, um, La Point, St. Mary, all these communities get their water from the Passius water project and this this water supply has been <coughs> overused, if you want to say that, um, and no longer can be can supply the amount of water, the volume of water that the community requires. So we're embarking on a project where we're going to put in a new treatment plant, and we're going to move away from the um, gravity and use a pump, the pump technology. So we're hoping that it's going to cure a lot of the ills as it relates to the problems that people have to endure in the community as it relates to water supply. Um, okay, so we've seen you over the past two and a half years serving as the deputy um, speaker in the House of Parliament. Um, can we see a change in your duties this year? Um, well, as I've always said, um, ministries, uh, that is up to the Prime Minister. And when he decides, um, I'm more than happy to serve in my current capacity as um, Deputy Speaker, I said I think that this is a role that I've grown in, if I'm honest with you. Um, and it's a role that really, initially you really don't know what to expect and having served under um, the stewardship of the current Speaker, Mr. Claudius Francis, I can say that I really got that big brother experience. I feel comfortable sitting in the chair. Um, but this role also allows me to spend a lot of time in my constituency. If you would um, notice over the past few weeks, I've been in my constituency basically every day except a Monday and, and part of that has to do with me not having the ministerial responsibility. Not saying that I don't think that I can offer more, but however, as I said, um, this is the Prime Minister's decision and I'm more than happy where I am and when the Prime Minister decides or if he decides um, to change my current designation, then when that time comes, I will be ready for whatever it is. So no discussion has been had, maybe just chatting casually about what role are the roles you could probably take up? Well, um, I will say it again, that that is up to the Prime Minister. Um, and when he's ready, or if he's ready, then that's fine. But currently, like I said, I'm comfortable in um, my current position. I'm happy doing what I do. It allows me to be able to serve my constituency uh, without having to worry about ministerial duties. And I think when somebody or when people go to the polls, they go to elect a parliamentary representative first and foremost. They, they, rep they go and they elect a parliamentary representative. And we should never forget that that is um, what the people go to the polls to do, to get somebody to represent them. And to add to that, you know, usually there is that misconception 
that if you're not a minister, um, then you're not able to do certain things or you're not as powerful as you, you should be. I just mentioned to you the amount of things I have happening in my constituency, and that is because I have the full support of my cabinet colleagues, who notwithstanding the fact that I may not have a ministerial designation, they continue to give me, provide me the type of support that I need to, to um, get some of the things that I want done in my constituency. I don't even know if I want everybody to hear all of the things that I mentioned because I may put some of my colleagues under some pressure when they hear the amount of developments that we could not have coming its way this year. Okay, well, having gone through that experience then, um, what are your thoughts on, I, I know some people have opined on our whole parliamentary um, system um, about, I, I guess, because as you said, people go to the polls to elect a parliamentary rep. And from that, uh, the ministers, the cabinet of ministers are chosen. Um, uh, your opinion, do you think that the system probably needs to change up where you could have people who are dedicated to their, their constituencies to ensure that it gets the necessary attention and maybe another process to choose the, the ministers? <laughs> and I'm guessing that this is stemming from a recent lecture, but um, the harsh reality is that we operate in a very small jurisdiction um, and sometimes it may be a little difficult to strike the right balance. And it is important that you have persons who are committed to their constituencies, as I said, and to their constituents, because these are the persons who elect you. But we also have to take into consideration that when um, men and women throw their hat into the political arena and they decide to run, it's because they too believe that they have something that they can contribute um, to this society. And for instance, if you have someone who is um, a qualified um, economist, uh, and who can, I don't think that you should limit them to just being a parliamentarian and then you have the divide of, of powers just because, or you have the separation of the powers just because. Um, I think it's just a matter of striking a balance. So I don't think or, that we, sh or I agree with the statement that because you run that you should, they should take away all ministerial duties from you. Notwithstanding the fact that I said earlier that I'm happy to be able to serve my constituents in the current capacity that I am, it gives me the amount of time that I need, especially given the dynamics of my constituency. My constituency is very unique. You know the history of Mikunov. Um, but I don't think that altogether that we should say, okay, separation of powers and that everybody who runs, because sometimes I think we have quite a few ministers. You, if you look at the current crop of ministers, the court of, of men and women who form the current cabinet, I think all of them are able to perform very well as ministers as well. So it's for them now to be able to strike the balance to understand that here's what I have a duty to country, I have a duty to my constituents as well, and finding the right balance and be able to work through it. But to say that um, because you're, you should only be a parliamentarian and then allow um, persons who don't face the wrath of the electorate to become um, or to form the cabinet. Because at the end of the day, we have a responsibility to those persons who elected us. And we are the ones who go and face the wrath. I'm the one doing the house to house. I know exactly what it is that the people are asking for, what they require. And I think to have just a separation, making the decisions on our behalf, um, we must have a balance. It's not good on the left, only on the right, only we must find some common ground and be able to work it from there. Yes, sir. As a person with disabilities, what more do you believe can be done for people who are, I guess, less fortunate in that way in St. Lucia? Because I know that, that many times people not only look down on these individuals, but also figure that they cannot get into that situation. You have a unique situation where you were in an accident and you became a person with disabilities. So what more can be done for these individuals? Well, there's a lot more that can be done for persons with disabilities, if I'm honest. Um, but whilst we're on that, I want to remind you that about two weeks ago, um, when we had the handing over of the checks to the Taiwanese, uh, checked, uh, one of the checks that, that was handed over um, was to deal with a national disability plan. And that is one step in terms of um, where we see ourselves as a government in terms of what we provide for persons with disability. I said there's a lot more that has to be done. Um, we've already started the consultation process. I'm thankful to the Taiwanese and the people of Taiwan for ensuring that they gave us that grant to be able to start the process. Um, they, we've always been, and for me personally, I think um, when you find yourself with a disability, you really understand um, what it is the, or the challenges that persons with disability go through. So I'm happy that, notwithstanding my own um, disability, 
that my cabinet embraced me. They treat me no different from anybody else, but not everyone is blessed with that privilege. So as a society, we must do better. And even as a government, we are doing better. As I said, um, we are embarking on a, a, a holistic plan to deal with persons with disabilities. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure exactly whether I should start if you asking questions or I can go ahead. No, I, I think this morning I, the main issue I wanted to deal with is um, I think you would have seen a lot going around about the opening of jazz. And I think I want to make it very clear um, that the opening of jazz will be at Mindo Fede Park. Um, last time when we spoke, I indicated to you we had not yet decided where it will be, that we were in discussions as it relates to the venue being upgraded and being prepared for the ICC Cricket World Cup. And we wanted to make sure that um, it would be available, both in terms of the works having been finished and in terms of ensuring that you know the handover is within the contractual period. Um, and I think I can confirm because I saw a lot of speculation, persons um, making a lot of, as usual, baseless statements and whatnot. Um, but the opening of jazz is at the middle of Philip Park, and jazz will get off um, in a fine style, um, as we did last year. Um, we also um, want to, and I think the last time we spoke again, I, I made mention um, that we were um, seeking to re-establish the Rangers unit. Um, I can confirm um, that the Rangers unit will be launched um, by the middle of the year. Um, we intend to um, you know, complete all the preparations and all the necessary equipping and to have the Rangers program um, in fully in place and to lend further support to the police force um, as they deal with other issues that confront them. So um, I trust you will um, take note that I can confirm on both of those scores the establishment of the Rangers unit and the opening of jazz for Mindo Philip Park. I know you have no questions for me, so I can. <laughs> well, unless you are there with what well, they not refusing to apologize, yes, he did offer an apology at me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> serious. I, I think politics is serious business, eh? and I, I think governing and being a minister and being a representative is serious business. I, I must tell you, when I listen to his response, it almost seems very childish, you know, um, almost like a petulant child, you know. You tell me, you say, sorry, well, I not me that sorry, it's you that sorry, and then you, you know, that kind of um, little children quarreling in a, in a schoolyard. So I will not quarrel with um, Dominic Fide. I will repeat that he's disrespectful, he is insultive and offensive. And to see that Labour Party supporters are largely criminals is totally unacceptable, that he embarrassed St. Lucia not only locally, regionally, and internationally. His comments were carried all over the world. And if you go and see, if any respectable journal had to write about the, um, you know, the, the usefulness of such a comment by a politician, he would rank very, very low. I mean, there's nothing more you can say. I will not argue with him. I will not, you know, engage in this schoolyard back and forth, he should apologize, he, I should apologize. Well, you want me to apologize? Well, I apologize for you. Um, and, you know, <laughs> I, this, this really, really is comical. And I think Dominic Fede comes across, um, you know, as a child, and a, a very petulant child, and, and that, that's how he appears. So I, I will leave him in his childish behavior. Um, there were reports that um a cruise passenger tourist was found in Castries with um, a firearm whose which license was um, expired. As the tourism minister, what, how do you feel about that and how would you say uh, perhaps ports could strengthen their security to ensure you know, these little things do not, do not get slipped past them? I mean, I, I can't speak of all the details. I think the police are best suited to do so. Um, but this was not the first port he had come in. He had been to two ports before St. Lucia. And he had the, from what I was told, the firearm in his, 
sack, you know, his shoulder, the bag, shoulder bag. And I think the police dealt with it. And in a sense, it showed that the systems worked because he had been to two previous spots and it had not been discovered. But of course, it was discovered in St. Lucia. And the police, in keeping with the protocols, um, dealt with the matter. And, and of course, um, we, we want to make it very clear that, you know, there is no, you know, tolerance of, of you know, persons carrying illegal firearms. In his case, he had a permit for it, um, you know, but still then, um, what he did was not in accordance with our laws and the police had to deal with it, like I said, according to protocols. Well, that, that's the point. Um, but I think the police and them and through um, governmental channels, the, the matter would be addressed along those um, lines. There was a recent banning of a Trinidadian dancehall artist um, in Grenada. Um, the government, I believe, cited that his lyrics were incited violence. Given our challenges with crime in St. Lucia, would we see something, could we see something similar if somebody would want to come to St. Lucia? Well, of course. I mean, uh, we're very clear in our minds that we do not support persons who um, engage in the promotion of lyrics that incite violence and, you know, and, and, and disrespect to, to other persons. So we're very clear on that. Of course, the police... Um, who is the one with the final approvals for the hosting of mass crowd events, and they would have to use their judgment. But our, um, you know, guidance on it is very clear. We would not support those individuals having um, shows in St. Lucia. Um, uh, one of the coaches who trains on the SAP, he recently raised um, concerns again about the use of the playing field for all entertainment purposes, events. Um, he still he says that um, again after some of the events you still get the feel not at the condition that it was the it was well what they handed to the the, the events company, um, and I think just the general use if you can speak to that I know the minister for sports had made a declaration um, was it last year the year before about the use of the played fields for entertainment um, your thoughts on all of this well I I think let, let us just sit down and reflect on it. We, we have no dedicated facility for mass crowd events as it relates to shows and entertainment. We don't in, in St. Lucia. So we have to double up. So, you know, Pigeon Point is used. Pigeon Point is a national park. There are serious issues of conservation and, and whatnot. So we too have challenges there. Darren Sami Cricket Ground is used. And of course, we have challenges. And of course, you would recall the minister had made a statement expressing his desire that there be no more uh, mass crowd events there because of the wear and tear on the surface. We are about to spend millions of dollars to upgrade the facility again. And it makes it even more challenging for us to have uh, mass crowd events there. Um, Mindo Park has been used in the past. Um, it is very problematic to use Mindo Park during the rainy season because of the surface. Um, the sab is a more versatile surface, and if you would know that, because it's a sun, it's sun base, it's very easy to do remedial works and to get it back in condition as against a dirt um, or soil surface. Um, so I, I've heard, you know, a couple comments from individuals, you know, at the sab. Everybody wants their surface to remain pristine and remain perfect for sports. We don't have the luxury right now of having a dedicated facility to go to. It is our intention to build a facility, and I think I would have said to you previously, um, we are looking at seeing how we can develop a piece of cul-de-sac lands to have a dedicated entertainment facility there. Um, and until we do so, we have to double up. That's just the reality. Um, when we, I, an individual did come in to me about the state of the SAB, and like I said to him, we get permission, we use the facility. When we finish, we provide monies to restore it. It is no longer our responsibility, but the management of the facility has to restore it. And, and, and I pointed him to go in that direction. Um, he's a user, but we pay to use it and we pay for restoration. So whoever is responsible for management ought to do the, um, the job properly and ensure that the surface 
is restored as much as possible. But until St. Lucia can have a dedicated um, facility for entertainment, we'll have to double up. Um, that's just the reality. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that we can get a facility built as quickly as possible. Uh, we won't face those challenges. Um, but it is a challenge for us. It's a, it's a significant item for us, I can tell you that. And also it's in Kalisak, which I have special interest in what goes on in Kalisak area. So, um, you know, the, the thinking is to have a, a youth creativity park alongside an entertainment facility. And it's a creativity pack that will allow young people to have incubator units to start small businesses, um, creative you know, units, and to really engage our young people and to add to the youth economy project that we are implementing. And of course, to have the entertainment. You probably will notice that the, the company that's in the construction, Namalco, is actually occupying part of the lands that we have identified for that purpose. So you can understand some of the challenges, but they needed somewhere so they can commence the work. Um, but hopefully um, we should be able to. We, we need to build it. There, there's no two ways about it. We need to have a dedicated en entertainment facility. Salmon's Park used to exist, but you know, with the hotel and the hotel eventually buying it over, it's not available anymore. So we need to get one. Speaking of areas for entertainment, are there any plans to upgrade the National Cultural Center? I know for, for several years, I mean, there have been challenge, infrastructural challenges over there. Are there any plans to upgrade the facilities there? Yeah. Um, in fact, we intend to build a National Cultural Center. In fact, we, um, it is something I've done a lot of research on. Um, I've actually spoken to the Taiwanese um, government about it because the initial discussion started off with them. Um, there is a deep interest in assisting St. Lucia in getting a cultural center, a national cultural center. Um, and we will, you know, as we continue to work, include it and the priority will raise. I think this year it has already been made very clear that our emphasis is on the infrastructure, upgrading roads, bridges, and some community facilities. So um, I'm hoping the year after probably will be the year for the orange economy. So we can, we can start, you know, raising the level of priority for some of those items. Um, as you mentioned, um, Salmon Park, could you give a general update as to where the hotel developments are in terms of their construction, what's going on and, and stuff like that? Yeah, no, no, thank you very much for this. Um, of course, Canel's development is continuing and um, the last briefing I had from them, they expecting um, hotel construction to finish in around the middle of next year um, and to do the final touches for the uh, property to open. Um, in the next um, two to three weeks, we will have a sorted in ceremony for the Grand Hyatt in Srozel. Um, we will start the construction of the bypass road because we need to do the bypass road before any works can take place um, in Shabusha itself. So we will have um, the, um, the sorted in ceremony for that um, hotel. Um, the Hotel on Ridgeway Beach, in April, Starfish will be broken down and Mystic will continue to open. In fact, there's such a huge demand for rooms in St. Lucia now. I think the developers are thinking of extending Mystic to the end of the next season because they already fully book um, for the year. But we're hoping by the middle of the year we'll have the sorted in ceremony. After Starfish has been broken down, and the surface cleared, we will then have a sorted in ceremony towards the middle of the year for um, the hotel development on Ridgeway Beach. Um, the Atlas development, LifeCo, the wellness um, resort, um, work has started in terms of clearing the site and um, for the refurbishment of the existing buildings. And we expecting to have a sorted in ceremony the ending of May for the actual construction to start. Um, very shortly, an announcement will be made about Black Bay. Um, 
for the construction of a hotel there. So I'll wait for the developers to make the official announcement, but very soon we will have an announcement on this. Um, today, Cabinet will consider a, a um, suite of incentives and concessions for the Prale. You would recall the hotel at Prale that has been abandoned since 2008. Um, we are going to, we, we, we're finalizing discussions for the recommencement of works by a, another developer there. And cabinet this morning, one of the major items for discussion will be um, the concessions and incentives to allow the developer um, to advance their preparations. So we'll give you an update on it. Uh, we're really hoping that all works well and that the project can recommence. It has been a priority for this government to find an investor that can recommence it because it's not only an ISO, but the potential impact that development can have on that region from Denry North all the way to Miku um, is hugely significant. So we will be um, updating you on it, but we are very advanced discussions with a developer and cabinet, like I said, will spend a lot of time today putting together the package to make sure this development can start. Um, the St. James Club, the refurbishment is continuing, and the plan is by the end of the year, it will reopen as a five-star secret um, St. Lucia. So we're certainly looking forward to this. And of course, the Kazaba um, Hotel um, should be opening you know, towards the end of the year. So. We, we, we are making considerable progress. We, we expect between Rajri and Mont Piment to add, you know, close to 1,005 to 1,700 new rooms just in that area. And then if you add Canels, you add Black Bay, you add the Grand Hyatt in Strozel, um, you can see over the next three years or so, um, there'll be a significant increase in the number of rooms in St. Lucia. Our target in the manifesto was 500 rooms. I think we will surpass that. Um, so over the next few weeks, be prepared to attend a, a number of certain ceremonies for construction to be starting on various projects. And in addition to that, we have quite a lot of tourism products that will be upgraded. Um, the Mon Lebai, um, the new Mon Lebai will start you know, in March. So you will be invited to this. Um, as fair on Millennium Highway, another lay-by will be built uh, in that area. So again, you will be part of that. We're looking to upgrade lay-bys all around the island. So visitors, as they go around the island, will have more updated, um, upskilled um, stops with proper toilet facilities, vending facilities. So you'll see an upgrade to ancillary, an upgrade to canneries. You'll see one being built in Soufre. Um, you know, we, as you go around the island, we want to make sure that there are strategic points at which visitors and locals can enjoy the beauty of, of St. Lucia. Um, the project in Grosile, the beach park, is also progressing quite nicely. Some of you were at the opening when, when we had it there. Um, we will start a new beach park um, at Mont Pimad. That's next to Starfish Hotel at the bottom there where quite a lot of St. Lucians go. We will be starting a, a beach park there in the next couple of months. Um, we will also be uh, the um, Bakai Beach Park, which was built under the previous government by Bakai and handed over to the government, had been allowed to deteriorate. So I don't know if you've been there. Yeah, Kalisak. It's actually a fantastic place. I mean, from volleyball courts, small goals, and uh, beach barbecue pits, whatnot. Um, it's really gone on. We're going to restore it and upgrade it. And, you know, it's going to be a, 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 fa a really fascinating place to visit. Um, so you will see over the next few months a lot of the tourism infrastructure being upgraded um, in St. Lucia. Do you have any um, details of the, um, what do you call it? I, I know in Babano they wanted to set up a whole ecotourism project. Um, any details on that? Yeah, For Babano, the, the project I know we're working on now is something in Plateau. We are working and there was a meeting last week between a community meeting which included um, my ministry um, discussing the community along with the parliamentary rep what we can develop because it's a fantastic view um, from Plateau, I mean, of the East Coast, um, a real fantastic view. So yeah, we'll be working on something in Babono. As you mentioned Babono, um, the Pima development, we're seeing like um, 
a new sort of infrastructural development where development developers are no longer looking for really flat land. They're going to take the hills as it is and do something with it. Do you think the government, because there's, there have been calls for more development in, in Babono, trying to turn it into a, into a town. Do you think you, we could see more, since we know Babono is very hilly, some more infrastructure along those hills for the people, a, a shopping center, maybe a, a bank here or there, something like that? Well, I know the parliamentary rep and her team and the council have developed a concept for the Babono Central um, for a shopping center and development. Babono has tremendous potential. Babono is one of the most scenic areas, and, and both in terms of the hills and the valleys and the rivers and whatnot. So Babono offers a lot, a lot. In fact, there is a developer that is interested and in started discussions with us, but um, you know, we, we've made our policy position very clear in terms of what can be done with Grand Hans. I mean, we, we recognize the environmental sensitivity of that area and we've indicated to them, you know, our feelings about that area and whatnot. So that's a very special area in St. Lucia. But throughout Babono, like you said, I mean, they, they have a lot of potential. They already have some touristic developments in Chasse area, um, you know, the sky rides and other community tourism um, attractions, but um, Babono is, is, is working now. I know the parliamentary rep, you know, has been having meetings, she's been engaging us, and we're certainly looking forward to, to more developments in Babono. Yeah? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sure you all can recall that some time ago, I literally showed that we had submitted some plans for approval to DCA for the construction of five buildings in Kazaba. I am pleased to report that at the Development Control Authority's meeting on Thursday last week, on Wednesday, sorry, last week, that the National Housing Corporation received full, and I mean full approval for the construction of those five buildings, each of which will contain 15 condos that are earmarked for the citizens of this country. As I indicated previously, the government in its discharge of its social responsibility to the citizens of this country will not incorporate the price of the land. It will not, the price of the land will not be included in determining the sales price. We will strictly factor in what we spent administratively and for construction and pass on that benefit to the good people of this country. Each of the condos, like I said, 15 two-bedroom apartments and we are hoping to commence construction pretty, pretty soon. Our Prime Minister has a very palatable way of putting it when the resources become available. I do know that that will happen in due course and I'm eagerly anticipating the commencement of construction in Kazaba. The good thing about this, uh, this approval is that it does not limit itself to the Kazaba area alone. Given the fact that the plans have already gone through the rigorous processing of assessment, um, the engineering, um, the engineering, the electricals and everything else have been assessed, what we are going to do is to use them as generic plans for replication in different areas. So once we identify the land in a given locality, it is a matter of DCA giving a site approval uh, for that locality and we can proceed. In other words, all the hard work has been done, all the engineering and electrical assessments have been done, so DCA no longer would have to interfere with that again as long as we are using the same drawings. What will happen is they will just approve the site and we are ready to go. So I look forward to the commencement and I look forward to the identification of other localities where we can put down some buildings at least to cause some kind of indentation in our house shortage which hovers around some 14,000 uh, deficit houses that we, we, we need now. So we are hoping that something will happen and it will continue on a steady path to relieve the people of St. Lucia 
and meanwhile to empower those who will be buying into those houses or condos rather. Um, last week, the Babano Parliamentary Rep, she revealed plans for Babano Central summer apartment um, buildings as well. Is that part of... Uh... Yes, um, she has... Um, she has been watching, <laughs> like uh, the parliamentary rep from Grusley was the one who literally pushed me into ensuring that approval was done with due alacrity. She has been waiting in the wings, so to speak, to ensure that approvals were granted because, as I indicated earlier, it is just a matter of replication. The good thing is in Babunu, NHC already has the lands. We have the lands, and that would even expedite it further. So um, I do see St. Lucia going on a tremendous development path insofar as housing is concerned. And I can tell you this is a tip of the iceberg because there are many investors who have basically signaled uh, the interest, the desires to assist the government of St. Lucia in ensuring that we, our housing shortage is dealt with in, you know, expeditiously. Uh, I remember some time ago there was um, a discussion about relocating some of the residents at Foasho. Um, is this still ongoing? I cannot speak to relocating the residents of Fula Show. You would understand that I am not the district representative for that area. Neither do I or myself or my ministry have any developmental plans for that area. So in that regard, I must express total ignorance. But whatever it is, we as a government operate as a team. And when push comes to shove, if my involvement is required, it will be at the table to ensure that whatever we do, down to the benefit of the people and it's one thing i can tell you this government will not relocate anybody without um you know commensurate comfort uh in whatever we give to them so we are a government that put the interests of people first and i can assure you if anybody is removed from Fulashu, it will be done with due consideration for the other areas that they will occupy in the year for infrastructure, are there any plans for rede redevelopment in the city center um, in terms of, particularly in terms of, of tourist attractions? I mean, Castries is our, our capital and there are not many tourist attractions in the city per se. So are there any plans in that regard? Well, you see, you are right. Castries is the capital and there are not many. Um, in my previous life as a government minister, um, there were two things I envisaged um, that needed urgent execution. Thank God GPH has come on board and will be executing one. That is a walkway along the seaside, in fact, on top of the sea, so to speak, from Point Seraphin to La Place Carinage. That is in the making. The other thing I really wanted to do, for which plans had already been developed, was um, pedestrianizing the boulevard. You, you pedestrianize the boulevard, you make it something like Brian Lara Promenade in Barbados, where you close it to traffic, vehicular traffic. And I think now the, the need is even more urgent because when you look at the, lac, the lackluster way in which vendors set up their apparatuses for sale, I am not against any vendor. I need to see this. I am not against any vendor. If there is one person who is for vendors, is Richard Frederick. I like to see a poor person attempting to survive and attempting to make an honest dollar. But that has to be done within the realms of reasonableness. It cannot be done in a lackluster manner. It cannot be done lawlessly. I mean, my reputation as a rep, all, each and every one of them, the vending booths that were constructed in cast trees, were under my watch. I built between 2006, 2011. I was out of government for 10 years and nobody in my absence built one. I resumed governance in the very capacity in 2021 and I'm sure you'll have seen a number of new ones uh, constructed. So it's a situation where I understand the plight of vendors, but you have to provide a balance with competing interest. You have traffic, you have pedestrians, you have the vendors. One, do you compromise the right of a pedestrian to use the pedestrian walkway because a vendor wants to fully occupy it? Do you do that? 
do you permit a vendor to sell where invariably they are causing traffic hazards? Do you do that? Not too long ago, where we demolished the CDC, that CDC there, the following day, I went there and there was a vendor with whom I have no difficulty, but the vendor actually placed a tent which was too wide for the sidewalk and had two feet of the tent encroaching upon the road. Now, folks, come on. No matter how you support vendors, no matter how you support vending, we have to understand that this thing must be done. Just like you all are now interviewing uh, ministers in a controlled environment, in a regulated manner, rather than meeting ministers and just shoving a, 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 a mic in their faces, this thing needs to be regulated. And I am one who will ensure that the balance of competing interests would be taken care of. So we take care of the vendors. I will do my utmost, and that is why I'm thinking of pedestrianizing the boulevard so I can send all vendors in the boulevard. Take your apparel, take your artillery, take your tools, take everything when the day is over. It's very unsightly, and I'll be dealing with that. I have some pictures. Yesterday, I'm driving through cast trees, and it was an eyesore to have seen. I passed Parliament on the right-hand side of the road by the print tree, I mean, you would swear, you know, you're in the jungle. I mean, this is not aesthetically pleasing. It does not go well for a city, as you indicated. And so we have to do things in a, in a better way. We, I want persons to survive. I want the vendors to make their money. But I don't want businesses to be compromised. I was, I was inundated with calls in the boulevard. Persons who own businesses in the boulevard. Persons come, set up tents right in front of businesses. How can you do that? You know, so their, their visibility is compromised. And invariably, if their visibility is compromised, their business activity will be compromised as well. So if I ask you not to place a tent in front of somebody's business, you know, you'll tell me ah, you're against vendors. No, you, we need to assert our rights without necessarily infringing on the rights of others. So all of those things need to be balanced. We need to put the interests of all stakeholders on the table and let's do it in a manner where basically everybody will be satisfied. You cannot get full satisfaction anyway, but at least there will be a greater degree of satisfaction when it is done in a regulated manner. So if we pedestrianize the boulevard and we send vendors there, vendors, no cars, we would obviously have to deal with the police, stakeholders, have meetings prior to executing that plan. But what we want to ensure is that given, give them that area so that other areas are totally relieved from all those ISO apparat apparatuses that we see you know, when they are not around. Um, I, I think some members of the public um, on social media would have complained about, as you said, un things that are unsightly. Um, some of the buildings we have in the city and uh, the state they are left in. Um, are there any plans uh, from your ministry to deal with this? And also, I guess I, think I rather suspect you eavesdrop on cabinet, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll tell you this: the the the, the prime minister um, came to that very observation. There are loads of derelict buildings in the city. There's absolutely no doubt about that. On Saturday and Sunday, myself, um, a quantity surveyor, and my attache Dax novel, we walked the length and breadth of the city. And we re came to the realization that there are many, many old buildings that need knocking down. And I'll give you one example. You leave Shosi Road going towards the convent. As soon as you enter that Leslie Road on your right, you have a series of old buildings, old galvanized. You know, it, the place looks like an ISO. We are hoping to get something done there. Even at the triangle, right there, that place is in a mess. We approached the parish yesterday, and I was pleased that the parish indicated, we asked them to pressure wash a building that is unsightly and to repaint it. They said not only you can do that, but they have an old derelict wooden building. They wouldn't mind us uh, demolishing it. 
So I think the expression on, of willingness on the part of um, owners of those derelict properties is there. They may not have the money. Not too long ago, I don't know if any of you knew, the old Mondido Lodge. You know where that is? Right. I demolished it. I demolished it with the permission of the lodge persons. They were so happy that we approached them to demolish the lodge and that was done. So we are hoping to get something done. We are doing the costings now. And I'm sure all of you will appreciate that with every exercise of manpower needs a commensurate amount of financial indulgence. And so as long as those areas can be fully rectified, regularized, I think we will be on the go to have a better looking city. Um, can you give us an update on the box park? Um, where is it at? Okay, the box park is on schedule. Um, it is on schedule and I'm hoping, I don't know what the, sh the completion date is. I don't know off the top of my head, but what I can tell you, it's on schedule and whatever date we are supposed to um, it is supposed to be delivered. It will be delivered without delay. Any up? Uh, the parking meters? Yes, I'm about to ask that. Yes. <laughs> the parking meters, we had, well, it's not a difficulty really. Our people are in, we had to employ people and train them to ensure that they know what to do and how to get it done. That is in the pipeline, and I do believe within the next six weeks or so, the parking meters will come on stream and will be fully. Um, will be of full effect in whatever locations that they are. Um, <clears throat> I remember you were talking about developments at Serenity Park, building an amphitheater. Um, we just had a conversation with the tourism minister who said there are plans to construct entertainment places in, in Kaldisak, but do you think as well, once that is done, the amphitheater in, in Serenity Park, um, organizers would be encouraged to have, you know, their events there because it's in castries and it's organized and whatever. Well, well, to be honest, um, we will be, um, I could tell you the plans for Serenity Park, the amphitheater are in planning. Uh, we will be executing this before this year is over. We will be getting it done. I mean, um, as long as I am involved, we get things done. There is absolutely no doubt about getting things done. I will not be micromanaging in terms of the use of the amphitheater. And I cannot tell you with any degree of certainty that it will be a venue that you can pay to use, whatever, whatever. I, I just, I will not get involved in that. I am more interested in the aesthetic upliftment of the constituency of my country and of course providing an avenue for persons to vent whatever talent that he or she may have. As to your use and the compensatory aspect of it, I cannot speak. Um, I cannot speak with any degree of certainty in that regard. But if persons want to use it, yes, it's in the city. City council will make a determination as to what conditions are imposed uh, for its use and by whom. It's a really good day, really, really good day. Well, we are officially in full swing for preparations for ICC Cricket World Cup. We had the launch last week. We have all contractors engaged. We have uh, employment being pretty much sought after in terms of various skills in the constituency of Grosley surrounding constituencies. And so we are cooking with gas, as they would say. Uh, we are full steam ahead in terms of where we are and what we need to do for Cricket World Cup. Uh, we have the lights, which is an integral part of how we're going to have a good event being broadcasted, uh, being uh, procured and shipped to St. Lucia. Um, we have the, the roof totally dislodged right now, and it will be replaced by a brand new roof. The air conditioning is also a uh, cause for concern in times past. We've uh, officially engaged a contractor, in fact, multiple contractors for our air conditioning and uh, we are just ready to go and ensure that with the, the sort of implementation of a local organizing committee that will have one of the best events in the region, for sure. Um, right, uh, one of the coaches who 
uses the VG plane field. He complained last week about um, the condition of the field and state of the facilities and whatnot. Um, I think he said that he had engagements with you or trying to have engagements. If you can just tell us from the ministry's perspective, what's happening with um, the VG plane field? Well, we have a situation in all our facilities, and I, I think we can, and I've asked some of the elderly people in my constituency whether they've ever seen a period where from January of one year until January of the next year, you have rain consistently every month. And so it has really hampered, hampered some of what we can do in terms of the, the interventions that we need for the maintenance of facilities. In addition to that, we are transitioning as a nation as it pertains to facilities. We have engaged contractors to develop a number of playing fields in St. Lucia to pretty much transition them to mini stadiums. And of course, VG, with the imposition of a semi-pro league, will receive that attention. So I can smile today because I know we are transitioning from VG being uh, multi-use by anybody and um, pretty much transitioning to ensuring that we can continue to have that, but in an enclosed setting with lights and the proper facilities in terms of toilet, in terms of pavilion. And so VG, after the budget, you'll be hearing certain pronouncements about what we are doing about the VG playing field and Central Castries being, you know, historically one of the powerhouses in terms of football. And so I am not concerned about VG playing field. I know for sure that it is not where I as minister would want it to be, but I'm very confident that by the end of this term, we will see a complete transition, a transformation for a number of facilities in St. Lucia, including VG. Um, I know um, earlier in uh, your tenure, you had mentioned about um, Darren Sami Cricket Ground not being used for any entertainment. Um, where, are yes, you? What, where, do you, where, where do you stand yeah. on that right now? I stand the very same place I stood as a national, former national athlete. I really am somebody who's passionate about sports development and I want to see it happen from uh, I mean six in the morning until six in the evening and then from seven in the evening until seven a.m. because I believe that is how we develop a nation. We ensure that our athletes have full access to our facilities. We've had cabinet discussions about where, um, an, an entertainment center um, for St. Lucia that would really assure that we could transition from actually having entertainment on facilities to reserving those facilities solely for sportsmen and women. And of course, this is the position that, that I've had from day one, and I'll continue to have that, that position as we as a government work to fulfilling that sort of mandate of providing the best facilities to sportsmen and women while the entertainment that we enjoy could be done in a separate venue. Until such time, I still hold true to the fact that I believe as a sports minister, and I'm not sure that you will find another sports minister in the region who does not agree with me. I don't think you can find another sports minister in the history of St. Lucia that would tell you they absolutely love the use of sports facilities for entertainment. You will not find that. This is where I am, and I'm very confident that I have a cabinet of ministers and a prime minister who knows where I stand as a minister of youth and sport, which is the portfolio given to me on how we as a nation ensure that there is complete usage for the youth for sports individuals and, of course, the wider community. Um, you had some engagements at, um, I in your community, your constituency, sorry. Um, you can give us an update on what... We've been, we've been having a series of block meetings in the constituency of Grosley, and we've decided that we are going to use that modality simply because it's more intimate than going into necessarily a community centre or somebody's homes. Um, we've had divided communities because of having meetings at a particular individual that is perceived to be either SLP or UWP. So we took the approach this year that um, we are going to literally stand under a light pole and have engagements and allow people to speak freely on what they see happening in the community and how I, as a, a parliamentary rep, can engage them to ensure that the community is better. So we had a, we had a meeting on Tuesday in Marisil, and we had two in Corinth. We had one on Wednesday and one on Thursday, uh, Flamboyant Drive. And of course, if you know the history of Flamboyant Drive and what happened on November 6, um, we really had some intimate discussion on retaining walls in that community, and of course, the river and the roads and what we could do. And I challenged that community to also not just have discussions on the infrastructure, but how we develop the human capacity of our individuals. I discovered in December that there were a number of elderly persons, even within that community, that were not given attention by 
persons living right next to them. And so we had discussions about how we could be our brother's keeper and how we could work together to develop our community. And of course, we are going to continue those block meetings. We have one on Tuesday night uh, in a community co commonly known as Black and White. And we have another one in a community of Grand Riviere on Wednesday after my constituency day. And on Thursday, we're going in the community of Moshi to have another one of those block meetings. Um, so we are continuing to engage people because this is really what it is about, a parliamentary rep that is staying connected to his people. And just to finish on the engagement with uh, persons, um, the, the Grosley Police Station continues in earnest. We've actually had the opportunity to employ a number of young people from the community to be part of the construction of the Grosley Police Station and similarly the Grosley Recreational Area. Uh, the work continues in earnest and I invite the media to go and see the progress of that project and the amount of young people uh, through this government that have the, um, the opportunity to develop their community. Maybe a bit of a selfish question, but w are there plans to upgrade the press area at the Darren Sami cricket ground? Um, when it rains, it de definitely pours in that area. So are there plans to... Um, Upgrade it in any way. Yeah. Absolutely. That is one of the, the sore points that we inherited. Um, the Sports St. Lucia Inc. and the National Lotteries and me as a as a minister. Um, the roofing issues at Darren Sammy was something that we were significantly concerned about. And this is one of the, the first things you, if you go there right now, you would see the intervention. And of course, with the uh, Cricket World Cup, that was one of the things that, that, that really uh, needed priority because we have press coming from all corners of the world. And so we're going to be expanding that press box. We are going to ensure that we have adequate shelter in that press box area and it's more comfortable in terms of the utility in terms of internet access and uh, I mean we remember that I was also a, a, a sports uh, journalist and so I know some of the shortcomings of that area and uh, so we've given that maximum we've given that maximum attention ladies and gentlemen the press good, good, good afternoon Yes, what can I, can I help you this morning? All right, I guess I'll go first. Um, yes, I do. The leader, leader of the opposition recently had a New Year's address. Um, in it, he gave a scathing review of the government's expenditure habits, uh, according to him. What he said, they were lavish in, in, but I do not know. I'm asking you a question. I do not know. He said, well, but he re did reference um, what he called expensive trips to Dubai and other things in his address. What is your response to that? Um, well, unfortunately, I didn't hear what the leader, I didn't hear what the leader of the division said. Um, I, I don't like to, res um, I want to, I don't respond to these things. These things are based on, the, they, they're not based in, on, on any fact. They're just emotional things that, that, that are being said. So I really want to deal with, with, with the, the, the important things. Um, the, the government is going to be, we're going to have a, our financial statement next month, 2020, for 26th of March, and we're going to see all the expenditure. We're going to see all the hotel bills. This prime minister has never slept in a hotel for 2,000 pounds per night. Um, so all these things are, are going to be shown. So I, I, I don't really, I really deal with more substantial things. Um, I really don't want to get involved in that. All I can tell you, I've never spent two thousand six hundred pounds a night to stay in any hotel. Never, from since my tenure. So when the former, if the former prime minister can answer that question, then can, I can answer his. But no, let's move to some things that are a little more. Yeah, I'm so, mm. <coughs> no, he didn't finish. Him finish. Yeah, I'm actually asking a crime-related question. Um, we saw in Grenada that the Grenadian government banned a dancehall artist, um, citing that his lyrics were filled with, with criminal intent, I guess. Um, should something similar happen in St. Lucia? Um, in fact, we have. We have done so. Artists have been banned from St. Lucia, yeah. They have been. This is, that, that's something that's happened. Probably you, you didn't pick it up, but that's happened before. A sad situation of what's going on right now. We see the crime situation already for it's the second month of the second okay. second month. Um, we're going to have currently ten homicides. 
We have heard the opposition spoke about the government is not doing enough. We know that the injection that the government has done in recent times. But something is definitely wrong, Mr. Prime Minister, with our country, with what's going on. To the government, it is the time has come for the government to come together to see what they could do to avoid those nails. The government come together. Well, the government and the United and the UW, or, well, opposition, the opposition did indicate they are willing to to um, come together. To um, how can you come together with people who call you who call you criminals? You see, these things are these things are first of all. There is absolutely no reason why any government or any citizen would want crime in a country. Well, I mean, what does a country have to gain by crime, by violence? Where is the gain by violence? You understand? So the idea of coming together as if it's something that you should be divided about is superfluous. You come together with, on things that divide you. But there ought to be no reason why we need to have any doubt that crime is not good for a country. So why are we, why, why are, are there two sides as it, as it relates to crime? Why is there an opposition side and a government side when it comes to crime? Why? Or violence? There, there's no need for a government side and an opposition side. I have said publicly, and I will say it again, that the police have all the powers within the law to bring an end to the situation. All the powers within the law and the observance of the human rights of individuals. All the powers. We've given the police more resources than the last government gave for the last five years in power. We've given them more resources. We've given them more independent operational, operational strength. We've increased their numbers. We are increasing their physical, their physical space. You understand? What we are doing, what any government can do, last week we gave the police two vehicles. This week we, we're giving them another two. We've given them drones. We've, I just signed for the improve their fingerprinting capabilities. So what's the, what's the matter of coming together? There, there, there is no division. If the opposition wants to create division with crime and violence, then they need to come together. When a leading member of the opposition, a former parliamentarian, can accuse more than 50% of the people of being criminals. I mean, this is a statement which I didn't want to, to answer, but you, you're asking me, because I consider it ignorance and frustration at its highest. Frustration at being in opposition. So I, I didn't want to answer it. But since you asked me, desperation at its highest. And that desperation can lead to, to, to other things. You understand? I didn't want to get involved in that. That's why I didn't answer it last week. But since you, 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 you answered me, you asked me, I'm going to answer. This is desperation. It's ignorance. And it shows the sign of drowning men who are clutching at whatever they can. But anytime the people of St. Lucia are called to respond, they respond. And I'm very happy with the response from the people of St. Lucia. Because the people of St. Lucia are not falling for that rhetoric. The, the, the people of St. Lucia are interested in St. Lucia moving forward. You see the responses to the battle relay. You see the responses to, to independence. You see the responses of, you see what the young people are doing. I went to a, a ceremony at the Sanders Grand. And when you hear about Viewfort, you would think that Viewfort is completely, complete chaos. The students who did the best are from the Viewfort Secondary School. That, that must be reported. 
The students who did the best are from the Viewfort Secondary School, from an area that is castigated. You understand? So I want to tell you that many good things are happening in, in, in St. Lucia. Many good things are happening in St. Lucia. St. Lucia's economic growth, when you hear it at the end of this period, you understand it is something that it could be more. Our unemployment is decreasing. Many things are happening in St. Lucia. But there are some people, because of their political, they are in the political wilderness, they will try to sell the name of our country for their own selfish political gains. There is nothing to be gained by sensitizing, making crime sensational. Nothing to be gained. The United Workers Party had their own problems with crime. They had their own problems with crime. Problems with crime and violence are not new to this country. They, 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 they're not acceptable. But the United Workers Party pretends as if when they're in government, there were no issues with crime and violence. From the time we'd been in, in, in opposition, we'd always said that let us not make this thing political. There was a national security conference. The then prime minister was not there. He chose to go to Jamaica to speak at a political convention. I was there. But you see, we seem to have short memories. The United Workers Party pretends as if they were never in government. And when I say that, some people say, say, say I should not get involved in that because I am, I am the prime minister. I should be above the free. I say above the free all the time. If I had to go into the free, it, it, it would be much different. So that, that pretends as if they were never in government. And that pretends as if when they were, everything was nice and St. Lucia just became violent on the 26th of July. This is hypocrisy at its highest. I, I don't condone what's I, I don't condone violence. We have been partnering now. You you speak about partnering with non-state people. If I tell you if I tell you the resources that we have put with non-state people in the NGOs, the resources that we, last week the SSDF had a major conference to get non-state actors in touch too, so that we can have some social interventions. This government has had the most social interventions to deal with crime than any government before. We've put resources, we've put money behind it, and we continue. So the idea that, 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 that this government is, 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 is staying back and allowing crime to, 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 to fester is wrong. I've made the point before. I am not, I cannot give operational advice to the police force. This morning we had a meeting and I said to the police, do whatever you can do, not breaking the law, to bring a stop to what's happening in this country. We are the government that brought in the regional security system. The opposition criticized us for it. We are the government that had the Escalated Crime Areas Act. The government criticized, the opposition criticized us. Look, look at our record. Look at the interventions that we have made as far as crime is concerned. Violence. Look at the resources we've put as far as violence is concerned. Look at the, the, the operational independence we have given the police force. Look at the legislation we've passed. We had the strictest gun laws. We've passed the strictest gun laws ever in the history of this country. That's, we did that. So let's not get carried away with frustrated opposition people. Look at our record. And, and, and if you don't want to go in, in, into their record, the, the record of their personnel, the statements of made on political platforms, if I commit crime, I commit crime on my own. We, 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 you know what I mean? We, 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 we pretend as if we've forgotten all these things. I mean, a situation where we've come from, we've come from heaven and we've dropped into hell. Crime is something that everybody dislikes. Everybody like a, a country that's peaceful, but don't pretend as if the government is doing nothing. Look at our record. Look at our record as far as crime fighting is concerned. Look at the statements my ministers have made compared to statements their people have made. Look at my record in terms of giving resources, giving financial resources to the police services. Look at my record. 
Prime Minister on this record. A number of people are calling for your resignation, saying no, that you're not. A number of people are not confirming. That, that, that is wrong. That's wrong. So I can't go for, I can't continue. That's not true. So it is the opposition yes. play, using, using crime as a political football. Would you say that? Are they using it? The, the, the opposition will use anything they can as a political and you know, I don't just talk about things that I've been saying. Why, why didn't you tell me what's happening before secondary school? How the students did well? Why don't you speak about how these students are? are the island scholar. It's from before. before secondary school, the island scholar. Yeah. yeah. We didn't report, we didn't report. Oh, you did, thanks. Right. Right. Oh, very good, okay. <laughs> very happy you did, yes. These accusations um, regarding your cabinet and its composition, um, again, the opposition leader made this statement in his address yesterday, accusing your your administration of, of harboring, uh, well, what do you say? What, let me use his words. There's a junior minister within your midst that is a criminal, I guess. That's what he's saying. Um, this is not the first time we've heard it. And why do you think these accusations keep coming? I don't know who he's speaking about, but if the person he's speaking about is who I think, that guy was only a member of his party. <laughs> you see, and these are the things that, 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 that you all forget. That, I mean, I don't, why, why are you forgetting that? Why are we forgetting that? Suddenly, suddenly you found that out? <laughs> Only now? You were prime minister? You had all the power in your hands? You had this guy five years on your back consistently and persistently. You did nothing. And you found that out now? That is hypocrisy. That is highest. It's hypocrisy. It's frustration. It, 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 it borders on, I can't say, on, on national TV. Next. Okay. Um, let's segue back into crime, but not that way um i would it's more like a statement not even a question really um do you think the issue with crime is that we don't really record our statistics of when cases are closed or when we have breakthrough in certain cases because yes the the number of murders may be high but what is our closing rate um, do you think that would actually help to alleviate public opinion on the crime situation in saint lucia i think as, as in most things, and, and you're asking a very good question, our communication strategy needs to change, right? We need to, you know, <clears throat> like, what's happening as far as the violence and crime is concerned? There are other countries in the region with that, that also have an, a, an issue of violence, but the approach is different. You understand? But... You know, and I agree with you because the police are making some very important breakthroughs. They, they've been solving some very, um, even what, what, what used to be called cold case crimes. Look what's happening in the forensic lab. We've put resources in the forensic lab to upgrade the level of scientific detection crime. The forensic lab has just got, has just got certified. These things are not, are not, not being told. But so you're very correct. But again, we can have discussions with the communications units in the police force to see if they can improve on their communication strategy. But you're very correct. The more, more ought to be told about that. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, a lot of um, crime fighting strategies comes down to technology. Um, I think most of the homicides that happened this weekend, it would have happened on the open street. And so we have to ask ourselves, were there... Um, CCTV cameras. I know there was some move recently to install them. So as the Minister for National Security, I know you've said you're giving the police resources, but what's the move to, to make not only resources, but technology available so they can fight these things in a, in a modern way? You're very correct. Technology, right? All I can say to you right now is that the Royal St. Lucia Police Force is at the moment upgrading its technological capabilities to deal with the crime situation. 
Can you accept that for me as a, as a, as a national security answer? I would like, I prefer not to. I, prefer, I, prefer, I mean, just bear with me for that. I prefer not to. We often don't get to ask you this question, but what is going on in your constituency? Any updates on your constituency? All right. See, I don't, I don't want the people in all areas to get jealous. Go ahead, go ahead, it's okay. Uh, um, okay. Sports-wise, we are doing, we've been doing some serious work on Mindy Philip Park. We've done two stands, and we're going to work in on the players' pavilion. We're changing the lights up there on the Mindy Philip Park. Marshall Grounds, we spent a million dollars there when I was there the last time. And I made that point. It was vandalized. I have a zero tolerance to vandalism. And I've told my constituents, when we repair it again, vandalism will not be tolerated. We are, we are redoing the, the stands at the, the, the Marshall Grounds. We just redid the, the Mali Purpose Court in Bocage. Just we put lights, we, we did it. We are in the process of doing two children's, two children's playgrounds. We, we did the playing field in, in, in Bocage. We, we put lights in it. Um, we, we built a court in, in Pavi that was vandalized. Um, we intend to redo it in terms of sports. Um, in terms of, of housing, We'll be making a major an announcement very soon. We are changing the face of the constituency. You will see it for yourself at some point. That we're going to see a complete a facelift that will please you. Any additional? Nothing additional? I mean, in terms of facelift, what what does that mean? You'll see it. You'll, you'll know. It's, it's going to be so. It's going to be so conspicuous. You can't even be able to miss it. All right. Um. <clears throat> I, sp I spoke about the, 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 plane, the plane facility in, in Pavi. I know somebody in this room has been very, been very persistent and consistent in wanting a road. Um, that, that is going to happen. So, you know, the, we want to, but what's serious, we want to do, we want to do some, some land. We want to get the people in Bagatelle to own the land that's there. And that's, the, that's a consistent problem because there are several owners, so you want to, we want to go to some land rationalization as far as the, 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 that, that piece is concerned. So generally, um, we're going to be fixing some of the roads. As you know, the roads, the main roads are okay, but some of the roads in the areas in Anchipo are, are going to be fixed. So generally, we, and the, the people continue to benefit. Oh, by the way, I want to invite you to the Marsha School. You see a brand state-of-the-art kitchen. You put so? See, do I hear good news? There's, I want to invite all of you. And I've, I've asked my press secretary to take you to, to the Martian School, the Bishop Charles Gashi School, to see the state of the art kitchen that's there. Rest of the art, you like it, you understand? So I want to give you an open invitation to, to, to go see it. So many things are happening. Thank you. I don't, I don't know who told you they lost it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who said they lost it. But I mean, I guess, you see, John men clutch at straws, you understand? So there's a big headline and this and that. You know, I don't, I'll tell you something. <clears throat> I'm so focused on this job. I'm so focused on the encouragement that I get from the people of St. Lucia. I'm so focused on the excitement I see among the young people going into the youth economy, trying to get loans to, to, to grow their businesses. I'm so focused at the, the products that I see young people are producing. I'm so focused on that, that I really don't have the time or the energy to listen to negativity, to listen to gloom and doom, to listen to people who wish the country bad, listen to people who get up every morning and say, what, what is the bad thing that will happen to us today? who get up and speak about castigating people. I'm focused. What I'm focused on is the development of this country. 
I'm focused on why I'm Prime Minister to see the young people get more and more involved in business. The, the, the number of, of small businesses that are coming all, all over the place. And I'm excited, excited about the year of infrastructure. I know that the roads are in a state that not pleasing. Not pleasing. I can't tell you that I'm satisfied with the state of the roads in the country. I'll be lying. I'm not, it's not, it's not I'm there. I can't tell you that. But there are certain things that are beyond our immediate control. One of them is the weather. Beyond our immediate control is the weather. One of them is. But we're not satisfied with the state of the roads. We're not. But we are hoping to have a, a big impact on the road conditions in the country very soon. Um, so what are your thoughts on um, the manner in which, I know the, the OECS has um, said, made a statement on it, um, they were not pleased with the way um, Mr. Hygienist Leo was sent on administrative leave um, as a... The OECS made a statement? No, 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 get, get, get right, no, get right, get right. A regional broadcaster made a statement and he said it came from sources in the OECS, yeah. right? So let's, let's keep it this way. <laughs> no, no, you know, the, the CDB is a very important institution. I'd rather let the processes flow. Because, they're very, you know, I did something. Sometimes we don't understand the damage that we do to our country by dealing with sensationalism and propaganda, you know. The damage, we're a small country. We have to understand what bad news and rumor causes. We have to, we have to understand that. So whereas we look for being, and this is why I'm so measured in the words I use and the things I say, particularly in things like um, violence and, and this kind of thing. I'm very measured because we've seen people pay. And, and, and this is why I treat, you, I treat you all with so much respect. This is the press. You agree that, right? I treat you with respect. I do treat you with respect. I don't castigate you and call you names and tell you, 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 I should be ashamed of you. I don't. Because even though sometimes I don't agree with you, but I treat you with respect. Because you, you're doing what you think, what is your job? You understand? I won't call you criminal. Never. I'll never do that. And you shouldn't forget people who called you that. Any question? Yes, but, Mr. Prime Minister, yes. uh, with the rules. Oh, I wish you were a rugby Oh, um, since Karim is not, no longer with us, I'm on my own, so I'm more on the mm -hmm. outside. Mm -hmm. Okay, girl. Yeah, um, with the Kalsak roundabout, is it possible that the media have a stand-down with um, Sir William? Is it, is it possible what? That we have a sit-down with, with Sir William. You have to ask them. Question, you can ask them. I don't think it's possible if we would do it on our own because they do not want to face us. Well, speak to the Minister of Infrastructure. <laughs> yeah. You, should, you could do it. You can, is there, that's, that's your, well, have you asked them to meet them? Pardon? You've asked them to meet? Mm. But that wasn't in my mind. So, yeah, sure. <laughs> so honestly, I, was, I saw Mr. Minister King, but uh -huh. that wasn't in my mind. But after, okay, uh, ask because him. Because we've been, persons are wanting to know what's going on with the roads, and I think it's a fair thing that we sit down and let the media question them to say what's going on. And I've also made that point that we, I'm not satisfied at all, but I made that point already. I mean, pretty, I try to be pretty straightforward and, 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 and frank with you, you know, because I want you to be able to always fact check me. Like, was very concerned about the tax bill. She didn't believe me until she got the truth. And now, and now you believe me. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't believe me on the tax bill. You see, I always want you to fact check me. I've always said to you to fact check me. You understand? You didn't believe me about the tax bill. I thought tax bill was all a sin about nothing. It was just propaganda, frustration, propaganda. Just fire, fire bullets, fire this, fire that. And you see... You've got, you've got the, 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 the truth now. 
I wanted to ask on behalf of the media, though. Um, yes. uh, one thing that has kind of hindered our work is the uh, there's this legislation that we've been, wait, we've been waiting to see pass the Freedom of Information Act. Um, uh, can we see under this administration this legislation coming in? The, the Minister of Information has spoken about that. Um, is we have, we have a very active legislative agenda, but the minister have, has spoken about it. I, mean, I think I can ask him for an update, but it's something that we are considering. Because, you know, they, you, ought, you ought to have nothing to hide in government, you know. And this is why when we put the bill out, the bill was put out, it was, I didn't put it out, but it just shows you how we run this, we run this government. We run this government with complete transparency. Trans, com, transparency in its entirety. So, so it went out, the technocrats put, put, put it out, you, you feast on it, but, <laughs> but, but that's all in, in, in a day's work. But always, what always sets me free is the truth. That's, that always sets me free, you know. So when you hear all the accusations, when, when the accusations die off, the truth comes to bear, and you see how the truth always prevails. So I want to invite you to go see the, the custody suites. You come with me? I'll tell you when. I, I go to, I try and and I also want to take you to see the the century at some point. Yeah, that things are going well there. I want to take you to see um, the Cruz de Police Station. I want to show you the the work on the halls of justice. We're going to begin that. I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a lot of things. I also want to show you some housing. Okay? Have a good day.